So welcome back to Third Age Reforged and to another battle replay and to another siege battle as well. This one headed up by the Easterlings on the defence as the forces of good in the north, east slash central regions of Middle Earth are going to try and dislodge them from this settlement, which I believe was given the name Lest. It's kind of reminiscent of the Ardenaim outpost in many ways, though there's a larger, flatter area to try and defend, so it's a little bit more difficult initially. Though the final stand area back here is at least fairly good to post up in, and this is a structure that you can use for a final stand as well, which does make a big difference, but hopefully we don't see too much of an over-reliance on that, and I'm sure we won't, because after all, uh, there's far more fun to be had when you don't make a battle a single choke point affair. Rudaur have marched quite a long way to back up their runic allies today. Um, should be quite interesting as well, obviously plenty of armour piercing on the defence, but we'll start off with the attackers. Nothing too fancy about the ground that the attackers have to occupy initially. There's a few terrain features, a few hills and the like, but for the most part the attackers are going to be able to uninterrupted really get up onto the same level to fight the defenders, but certain uh, structures can be placed in their way of course to make life a little bit more uncomfortable for them. Uh, but a 3v5 as well, so certainly big advantages go to the attackers in a 3v5 naturally, and on a map like this, which is open and quite difficult to defend initially, like I said, um, I do think that the attackers are in a pretty good place here. And with the forces of good, um, you can often have some pretty damn efficient units at the high end and the mid tiers to help you take a lot of damage as well as deal it. Starting off here with Hidden Zed. The Dalians, of course, one of the natural enemies of the Easterling, some upgraded Dalian spearmen, maybe not um, the best at dealing damage, but considering the numbers advantage the attackers are naturally going to have in this kind of situation, first and foremost, they're going to need to be efficient, they're going to be need to be able to uh, stand and fight for as long as possible, and this is the kind of unit that will allow you to do that for a relatively small outlay in terms of the defensive values that they do offer. We also have some Lake Town infantry over here, somewhat of a rare kind of unit in the game in the sense that they're light archers and light infantry put together. It says heavy infantry but that's more or less a lie. Um, and the Lake Town infantry, they don't have an awful lot of ammunition but they are a decent multifaceted unit for a very small cost for what they offer really. However, when it comes to one-on-one -on -one fighting and when it comes to outright quality they will be found lacking um, even against uh, really some of the very basic units of uh, the Easterlings and Rudar considering the damage those two are going to be able to do. More Dalian Spearmen back here. A central facet to Dale's army, however, is their mid to upper tier units of human infantry, which pack on more armour, perhaps courtesy of their close trade with the dwarves, albeit with their own style. Heavy lamellar armour on these Barding Herd units, for example. Um, very, very tough for a Halberdier unit, actually. Naturally, a few weaknesses to pole arm units, but armour does help offset that somewhat, as well as the shields they have on their backs. Armour piercing as well is going to be somewhat useful for the attackers, certainly against the Easterlings, maybe less so against the Hillmen from Rudauer. But an anchor is still going to be necessary for the front lines here for Dale, and it's the sort of thing which can certainly make life very uncomfortable for defenders late on if they are unable to deal with them with any sort of supporting units. Swordmasters of Eskaroth with the armour upgrade, so these sorts of human swordmaster units are fairly commonplace among the western kingdoms of men, of which Dale are probably the furthest east depending on how you want to count Dorwinia. Um, but yes, yeah, Swordmaster of Eskroth should actually be very good against the likes of Rudar and the entry-level runic unit, so it makes sense that they are here. Blackshot Dragon Slayers with their armor-piercing projectiles are pretty much an ever-present. Dale, much like Lothlorien, because of how strong their high-end archers are in melee relative to much of their infantry, there's really no reason not to bring them. Um, and the armor-piercing projectiles, of course, are going to be very, very useful at targeting down individual units of high-tier infantry. The catapult as well, there shouldn't be too many issues for Dale actually wheeling these artillery pieces up into a more useful position, and it does also light a fire under the defenders to pick their ground carefully where they choose to make their stands. More Lake Town infantry, we've also got some Lake Town pikemen. Uh, they don't come with the armour-piercing crutch that the Barding Herd do, but all around their stats are of course lower, they are far more fragile as well given their significantly lighter armour but they do have the increased range of pikes in melee, so that is something to bear in mind. And we also have the Dalian Paladins over here, and armor-piercing shock infantry. And like I said, armor-piercing, maybe not the be-all and end-all for the attackers on this occasion, but still, in terms of 
dedicated infantry units, the best that Dale have by a significant margin. Moving on to their closest allies, here we have Y2K86 playing as Dorwinian. Like I said, I don't know if you could necessarily count Dorwinian as a Western Kingdom, because they're further east even than some of the borders of Mordor. So, uh, yeah, they're really an Eastern Kingdom, though they're very different from uh, many of the others that inhabit those lands. Alvelin infantry, very much in a Western style, however, given the fact that their main selling points are how resilient they are and not only that they also have increased stamina as well which is nice it keeps them going for a little bit longer um, and they along with the Alvella marksmen behind them although the marksmen perhaps to an even greater extent given their utility and long-range skirmishing and how awkward it can make life especially for defenders like Rune and Rudauer um, setting up with some solid archers and bombarding them from afar especially given how this map is laid out is exactly the sort of thing that Dorwinian can do but yeah plenty of Alvella units including the Vineguard Spears, of course, have got slight defensive advantages in melee, but that comes with offensive malices. Um, so, yes, we also have the Morakwendi Glade Masters here. Possibly going to be one of the last times we see them in this format. They're being changed to a dual wielding kind of unit. I think to differentiate them a, a little bit from the Elven King's Palace Guard to make each unit a little bit more distinct from one another. As it stands, they are pretty much the same thing, only the Palace Guard have an armor upgrade available to them. Um, but that should help uh, differentiate them. But for now, obviously, all round, fantastic. Armor piercing, anti cavalry, very high base damage, really good melee defense. All round, um, one of the most diverse units that the game has to offer at the high end. Um, the rest of the army I can assume to be hidden, which means river patrol are probably around, as well as Moraquendi units, both on horseback and on uh, foot with bowmen and the like. Now then, Erebor, to complete this uh, triumvirate, really, if Merc were here as well. Um, it will certainly make a lot of geographic sense. We have the Warlord. Um, Ironfoot crossbows, they... It's a little bit different to heavy archers, but given the way that this map is laid out once again, ranged attacking units like this can really put the screws to the defenders, and especially if crossbows get set up in a position, it can be devastating, especially when it comes to these dwarven ones, because unlike some other units of crossbows, you can't get rid of them quickly because of that dwarven armour um, from afar, so you're going to have to try and basically where the defenders pick their first defensive, defensive ground to stand on is going to be vital in this match because not only the archers with their slower but more consistent damage but then the crossbows with their quick punchy damage it's going to be a real danger for them if they're not careful just in behind iron for spears regular dwarven infantry like this is always going to be efficient for the tier that it is in relatively speaking um, armor piercing will be useful against the dwarves so more so than against even Dorwinian and Dale that we've already seen. So Rune and Rudar will at least have the tools to worry the dwarves in melee, if not through quality, then through the damage types that they have available to them. So yeah, plenty of spears there. We've got some dwarven miners just to pad out the numbers, of course. When you're the five attackers against three defenders, sacrifices are going to have to be made somewhere, especially with quality heavy factions like dwarven ones. Um, so yeah, the Dwarven Miner is not necessarily the biggest fan of them mechanically, but they do serve a purpose in the game as a whole, and you're not really supposed to be depending on them to give you the victory all on their lonesome after all. Numbers are important as well. Iron for Axe Thrower is a very useful unit type in the current meta of the game, though I don't know how much longer this version of the game will be commonly played for, but yes, plenty of base damage from them. Armor Piercing, once again, being employed by the attacks as well, though not too surprising given the uh, options that Erebor have in their roster. Halberdiers and Axe Guard of Erebor are in there, Ironfoot Warriors as well, going to be trying to do that damage on the front line. They should be reasonably efficient against especially some of the lighter Rudau units, so the Armor Piercing they receive in return will be a worry. Ironfoot War Goats, single HP, unshielded cavalry, though heavily armoured. I don't know how useful cavalry is going to be on this map. It is a little bit more open up on the plateau that the settlement rests upon, but even then, I don't know if there's enough room for cavalry necessarily to be all that effective, but we'll see. Blacklock Engineers, another unit of crossbows, of course, though this a body piercing one, one of the potentially most devastating units the game has to offer, though it's been a while actually since we've seen them live up to their full billing. We'll see if they can do that this time around. And another unit of Ironfoot Warriors as well. A little bit further afield, another Dorwinian army actually, this one from Proxima Sanctuary. So he has got plenty of Alvel and Marksmen with the stakes deployed. I highly doubt that the attack or the defenders, rather, will be so eager to come this far into uh, attack at Hell territory, but you never know. We've also got some Moraquendi bows, which we didn't see before. Poison arrows are an interesting one. I mean, defenders can be routed, and especially given 
that Rune and Rudauer are, well, Rudauer especially, actually, are a little bit more uh, susceptible to this sort of thing, given the tier of units they often rely upon. Poison projectiles could actually be another really useful tool for the attackers here, so plenty of ranged danger for the defenders to deal with. More Alveon infantry, a really solid frontline unit. Both uh, bodyguard tier units are here, so a little bit greedier, perhaps, with bodyguard units. Proxima Centauri, especially given the more restricted budget the attackers have to work with, but still, more Glade Masters. Individually speaking, a fantastic unit. And of course, the armor piercing of the Hammer Guard, not the be all and end all, like we've already said, but it's still the kind of unit that Rune in particular are not really going to be thrilled to have to try and go up against. A couple more units of our Valentine down at the back, more bows, and that's all we can see. There could be a few other hidden units as well, though. And last, but by no means least, indeed it is, it does make geographic sense, other than Rudal maybe coming all this way. JKL playing as Merc would a little bit more difficult to build an Elven army on the attack when you have this small of a budget. Um, but still, he's done his best. He's gone for armor upgrades as well, so he has gone for a little bit more quality with the Hiri out and the Hiri Lung. I mean, it will give them a little bit more staying power over the long run, which could prove to be very important. But he has also had to dip into the basic Emondwea units, which is not too surprising given the budget restrictions that he would have had to work with. Javelins as well, something which we haven't maybe seen up until this point. We've seen some axe throwers. Javelins a little bit more difficult to use, maybe a little bit more unfashionable in this version of the game. Though the armor piercing punch they do offer will still be helpful should they be able to get into position and uh, utilize them well enough. Really not so sure about the Huntsman of Amon Lank, however. This is a very expensive unit, and like I already said with the War Goats, it's going to be very difficult to utilize them effectively, especially given how fragile they are. Unlike the Ironfoot War Goats, they don't have the armor to fall back upon. So if the defenders can keep their shape, this is one way in which they can get some really good value off with a few well-placed volleys. The Ents are here as well, another expensive unit though, far more understandable why they, why they are here, because they can really disrupt a front line very, very quickly if they're deployed at the right time. More Hiri Lung, and there are Elders of the Elven King in here as well. So Silverthorns, maybe more typically thought of as a defensive tool, but disrupting defensive lines is something that they can also do as well. So a small army, but not too surprising from the Elves. I imagine there is going to be some sort of grace period with Leech here, who sent me this battle replay, so big thank you to him, um, and his runic army probably going to be allowed to get into defensive position in the settlement. I think in a 5v3 in this sort of situation, the defenders do need a little bit of leeway. Uh, the Carmel Shadow Bows, of course, Rangers, something which the defenders time and time again have used as a very effective tool in this version of the game, and they will need to do so this time as well. Like I said, it's going to be an uphill struggle for them, uh, metaphorically, if not uh, physically. But yeah, Shadow Bow's positioning going to be key. Like I said, initial positioning here could be everything for the defenders. The Narim and the Variag Mercenaries, both of which are a little bit more basic in terms of what they offer. Narim, Flaming Shot, Variag Mercenaries are a little bit more uh, well-rounded defensively and I think a little cheaper as well. Um, so that does make a big difference. And skirmishing is going to have to be something the defenders do, even if it's not something they want to do. Crossbows, something the Eastlings can also rely upon as well. Of course, even with these armor upgrades, it's not something that's enough to them above and beyond the dwarven ones we've already seen but the punch of these crossbows is still going to be absolutely vital if the defenders are to be victorious not too dissimilar to Arabor actually in terms of how their ranged units are set up but four units of crossbows is a lot uh, maybe pike and shot is how rune intend to win this one but it's risky because these strong crossbows uh, can be undone by some well-placed skirmishing and of course heavy aggression if they've undercooked their infantry force Having said that, the infantry force looks just fine to me. I mean, several units of Flag Rim, the armor piercing, a worry for the human factions and, well, the humans and the dwarves, basically, across the whole field. Elves are a little bit more well-placed. Gamperim as well, in terms of how to stack up, I didn't see any more of Wendy Pikes, so for the most part, it did seem that Halberdiers are going to be the primary phalanx unit, which is a good thing for Rune, because it means that they're not going to be overmatched in that uh, regard, too, obviously. And then obviously defensive bulwarks in the form of the Loke Scion Rim. Um, obviously they lack the punch that the Gamp Rim and certainly the Flag Rim have, um, but it's still going to be very important here. They're going to need these uh, units to really lock it down on the front line and hold the enemy at bay for as long as they possibly can. And plenty of bodyguard units as well. The Sapphire Bladesmen are maybe a seldom seen unit of high tier Javelin men. Two units of Carmel's chosen, so it's going to be some good quality sprinkled throughout this front line. The heaviest runic army we've seen for quite a while and then the very dangerous dragons wrath crossbows of course with their body piercing crossbow bolts much like the blacklock engineers potentially devastating though we haven't seen them live up to their full potential for a while and i don't know 
a flatter map like this actually might be a really good thing for them. Moving on there, we have the second of the runic armies, this one, Seraphim. He has got some Carmels chosen as well, though it looks like just one unit for him. He's gone for the Carmel Shadow Guard, so that armor piercing. We've already mentioned the armor piercing will probably be more useful for the defenders here, and it will have to do a fair amount of the heavy lifting for them, um, considering the deficit they're already running at. Several units of Gamprim, several units of Flagrim, like we've already said, three of each, and that is a good solid front line. Dependable, um, depending on how useful the armor piercing is, we'll see if it's spectacular enough to give them an edge there. A couple of units of upgrade of Balkov Trisman, it will make them just that little bit more resilient, though whether that will be enough to make a big difference or not remains to be seen. Sapphire Bladesman already mentioned, be interesting to see how they get on here actually, because like, like I said, they're probably the least seen of the Runic Bodyguard units, though we do see them from time to time, they're not a completely unseen entity. A couple of units of Narum and, up, and the upgrades as well are on the Variag Mercenaries, which is interesting. We also have more Shadow Bows. Now Cavalry, as we've already mentioned, the attacking Cavalry is actually fairly weak. The Dragon Knights will be able to easily beat them one-on-one, -on -one, uh, both of them. But stuff like crossbows and stakes and plenty of anti-cavalry options means there's still a lot of peril for the Dragon Knights to have to deal with, but they could be really useful. There's also the Dragon's Breath back there and a couple more units of the Scion Rim. I mean, artillery like that could be really devastating, but in an artillery duel, you probably back a standard catapult, which is worrying because you can't sink that much money in and expect to get away with it. Um, if it goes poorly for you, if you're the defenders. And finally, add in men, Rudauer have come a long way to reinforce their Easterling allies, Sauron moving his chess pieces around. Rudauer marksman, when it comes to skirmishing over a long period of time, the extra ammo does help, but the uh, armour is certainly a lot scrappier than the armour of the archers they're going to have to trade back and forth with, though a third unit of rangers will do something to worry the attackers, certainly for Anodyne rangers to add to the two units of Kamal's shadow bows. Throwing projectiles are one area in which Rudal will certainly worry the attackers as well. If they move in either with not overwhelming force or if they go in in drips and drabs, then Rudal's throwing projectiles could really be a problem for them. Franodyne Berserkers also back this up by being very savage in melee. The Atomals Troll Hunters, of course, can make for decent line holding spears, but for the most part, it's going to be javelins first and foremost. Throwing axes, we've already briefly mentioned them when talking about the Dwarven ones. The Troll Shores are significantly more fragile, though the fact they can hide anywhere does give Rudauer the ability to only engage when they choose to. Two units of Witch Realm Enslavers, so doubling up on bodyguard units across the board here for the defenders. Plenty of armor piercing on them. Very, very dangerous, of course. Also, the Blackwald's Berserker class units may be less well rounded overall, but there are more of them, and this is the kind of unit which will give you a lot of punch very quickly should it be required. And then some of the more rank and file units, some upgraded Rudar clansmen. They may not be as spectacular as the Scion Rim, but they will still do a job for you. And uh, it does mean, of course, that Rudar's army is rather large, which evil factions on the defense do have the ability to pad out their manpower a little bit more, so the numbers discrepancy is not quite so severe. A couple of units of Dunman pikemen as well will be useful for holding the line. The Rudar swordsmen here, mainly for numbers, they will do fine. Um, obviously Dunman Spearman certainly here for numbers, and another unit of Knights as well, upgraded for Anodyne Nobles, so Cavalry, Rangers, Artillery, they have all of the tools here, the Defenders, to make this work for them, but like I said, numbers-wise and just purely from the map layout perspective, you would still give the edge to the attackers, but uh, without further ado, let's get this show on the road, shall we? I don't think there's going to be too much of a need to make too much of a cut here either, purely because... I imagine that the attackers are actually going to get into position and be able to get up onto the plateau where Lest is located fairly quickly into the fight. There's really nothing stopping them, like I mentioned in the composition phase. The, <coughs> the difficulty the defenders may have here is the fact that this is so open. Fighting on largely even ground for the most part is probably going to be a significant hurdle for them to overcome, especially given the quality of some of the attacking armies and some of the supporting tools they have with both Erebor and Mirkwood on the field backing up their human allies. I guess the Morrowind are here as well in fairly high numbers. This also means the armor piercing isn't going to be quite as effective. Forces like Rudawa do have their very obvious defensive deficiencies as well, but that's a good point. We may very well be able to see 
some of the Rudau units that have revealed themselves from hiding now. Though looking at it, Dunman Spearmen, Black Waltz obviously can hide. Unsurprisingly, the Troll Shore Axe throws the Thranidine Rangers. Rangers always going to be a very important tool in a defender's arsenal in this sort of situation. You can see that the Kummel Shadow Bow is already in place, actually. And there's also the small matter, Morikwendi Stalkers revealing themselves, so some horse archers, which with their mobility, they will actually be pretty useful. Though stuff like the Dragon Knights and the Hranadai Nobles are going to be too strong for them to tangle with one to one, but that is something that the attackers will be hoping that they can keep contained to the best of their ability. Definitely not the sort of units you want running amok, but also very expensive for the defenders to have invested this much into it, so there is a grace period here. Hopefully it doesn't outstay its welcome. As soon as Leech is actually up onto this plateau area over here, I personally would suggest that there's no real need to leave any longer. But we shall see. It's not an overly long battle, this, considering it is a rather large-scale siege, though part of that is probably the fact that this settlement doesn't really lend itself to being overly grindy. The only, really pl the only place you can really do that is in the final stand, up in the top corner of it. No immediate rush from Erebor to start moving into the settlement. Then we also have... So are Rudauer going to be the ones to try and marshal the dwarves? Probably the best fit. Rudauer will struggle far more against the elven elements of the attack today. Troll hunters as well, so Dorwinian going to be taking the lead over here with the backup of Dale, so more of a human edge to the attack here. Erebor going to of course be moving up this way with some support from Dale as well. Opening Gambit maybe to try and engage in a little bit of skirmishing, which is not the worst idea, I think. And over here, Alvalin Marksman. It would definitely make sense for Dorwinian to be the ones to go first over here. The very small nature of the Mirkwood army. With them round patrol. Also got the Greenwood Watchers, the Assassin class unit. A little bit difficult to use, but potentially damaging. Huntsman of on Lank is a really interesting choice of unit as well. Ents. Yeah, Mirkwood pretty well set up to be a supporting army here, but they can't really do much of the heavy lifting in the way that Dorwinian may very well be able to. As Rune continue to march into position, trying not to lose too much in the way of fatigue. Yes, I fear I made a little bit of a misjudgment here. I thought the battle would be getting underway a little bit uh, a little bit more quickly than this, but sunk cost fallacy is starting to kick in. We've got one Woodrum Enslaver who's still really taking his time as he slowly ambles up the hill. Two units of Morikwendi Stalkers. And it looks as though the defenders are going to be attempting, at the very least, to use their cavalry late game rather than early on. There's a lot of power bound up in that cavalry. If they can blunt the attackers sufficiently, then late game, the sort of hammer and anvil strikes that Dragon Knights and Ranadai Nobles can deliver may be the difference here. We've also got three units of Rangers, plenty of supporting units as well, crossbows, javelins. So they're not lacking for match-winning potential here, the defenders, but whether they will actually be able to follow that through remains to be seen. Sheer numbers of the attackers often proves to be the undoing of a defensive army after all. Still, none of the attacking armies look too eager to be the first ones to move in. I mean, at this point, to me, the grace period should be over. The defenders are in place, and sending their units to jog the final 100 metres is not going to be the difference maker in the battle overall. Red mercenaries ready and in place, Rune guarding the two flanks, and the central position will be Rudow's responsibility. Again, I do like how that has been decided upon Rudow 
All of, well, to be fair, all of the defending armies will actually be fairly well set up for fighting the dwarves. Quality might still be a concern, but the arm piercing is certainly not lacking. But Rudauer would be a little bit more exposed against elven position, I think, than rune. So it makes sense to try and minimise your weaknesses in that regard. Dunman Pikeman could be an important unit here. A little bit easier to more freely use your pikes as a defender. It's starting to get much closer over here now. Narin, perhaps. Bariag mercenaries. Now Valin moving forwards. You don't really want to be getting into a back and forth with the Alvalin marksman or something of that ilk if you're the defenders. A well constructed line. Spearmen out in front, shielded units first. It looks as though the attacks are going to test the line and the resolve, I suppose, of the defenders, or it looked like they were going to, with the woodland protectors moving forward with a volley or two from the javelins that would have done a decent amount of damage to the Scion Rim. Marksmen are in place, so stacking up now. I mean, this battle, like I said, it's not the longest in terms of frames anyway, so I'm a little bit surprised about all of the dawdling that's going on here. But oh well. Time for spears, warriors, hit the axe throwers. Another thing that the attackers, if they can use them just adequately, the kind of damage they can do is extremely significant. Well, in Vineguard. Are we going to see the fight actually get underway? Another example of a battle where the grace period was taken too far, in my opinion, but surely it's over at this point. Surely. There is nothing else to be gained. Dalian Bowman still not moving up. Darwinian still not moving up over here. Come on, guys, please. What is this nonsense? Are we actually going to see some combat at some point? Woodland protectors, are they going to throw a javelin volley or two? It makes sense for them to do so. Scion Rim, very solid kind of unit. Javelin's one way that you can whittle down their manpower a little bit. But so far, still nothing. More than that, there's actually still no movement from the other attacking armies. Like, are they waiting for an invitation? I don't know. Ah, finally. I don't know if that was the grace period ending or what, but if, it, if that seriously was like the grace period's time, that was ridiculous. Far too long. Variag mercenaries going back and forth now with the Alvalid marksman, the Nar Rim as well. Javelins throwing a volley into the front line, a couple of the Scion Rim do fall, but the Woodland Protectors, perhaps unsurprisingly, are the target of some of the defending archers. Plenty of arrow fire already on the field. Still able to get a few decent volleys off, though not a devastating amount of damage done to the front line. Not the sort of thing they will be overly concerned with, I think. Protector's going to try and get a little bit closer, but of course if they get too close, that will be all the excuse the defenders need to simply move their line forward a little bit, and that's exactly what's going to be happening. Although that is a much better volley, direct into the Scion Rim. Now what will the Woodland Protectors do? Will they attempt to flee, peel themselves off the Scion Rim? They're going to take a fair amount of damage regardless. Spear on spear violence, but the Scion Rim significantly heavier as a unit goes, and more and a dedicated melee combatant, of course. Unlike the hybridized woodland protectors, though, Ents are coming in. It's now the time for the Ents. I mean, infantry reinforcements are fairly close by. Flag Rim, none of these units are especially well suited for taking on Ents. You may very well need a unit of shock infantry or the like if you are to have much in the way of success there. 
but the attackers, I mean there's I'm for Spears, there's some Dalian Bowman shooting up the hill, but their angle is not particularly fantastic. A little bit of a disjointed assault so far from the attackers. They are opening up with some initial skirmishing, Lake Town Infantry. This is kind of what I would have expected, though I do think that the attackers could be doing this a little bit better if they were able to get up onto the plateau, which shouldn't be too difficult. Just apply a decent amount of pressure to the front lines and you should be just fine. Especially over here, I think the dwarves and with a little bit of support from Dale, they do have a bit of a golden opportunity given that Rudauer's defensive attributes are not the highest. If he seems certain, only a military genius could win this battle. Dunman Spearman. Not the most dependable unit in the world. Pikeman a little better, Rudar Clansman. Not an overwhelming force by any means though, that Erebor ascending forward, but then again the dwarves. How expensive their armies tend to be, they can't just throw limitless numbers at a front line in the way that some of the evil factions can. The support of these crossbows could yet prove to be extremely decisive as well. Rudal and Marksman firing in. Further down over here, this is a much more genuine assault, which is kind of weird again. Like I said, Merkwood's army, the smallest among the attackers, so they're going to be able to keep this sort of thing up for the shortest amount of time. They're going to be heavily dependent on Darwinian's human units to keep this going. Greenwood Watchers coming in, the Ents as well, but... The Ents are probably doing a fair amount of damage here, actually, buckling the formation of the Gamp Rim. That's going to be enough to really give them pause. Some food for thought. But ultimately, the Ents should be brought down here. The armor-piercing will be coming in handy. Who's actually coming out ahead of this little engagement? We'll only really be able to judge as the battle develops, and if Darwinian and Merck would start to make progress fairly soon after this, we can surmise that probably a good choice. Still plenty of those Elvelin units as well, so it's the sort of thing they're going to be able to keep up for some time, but the quality, you can see the Greenwood Watchers now attracting the attention of the fiery arrows of the Narim. Dangerous enough, I suppose, in melee and at range, and as with a lot of the sort of mid-tier of Merkwood units, they do have a tendency to be relatively lightly armoured have their weaknesses. Merkwood may have very strong archers themselves, but they do have a certain weakness against enemy ones, simply due to their lighter nature. The Ents are really starting to come unstuck a little bit now. These strong crossbowmen, as you can see, even with the armour upgrade, they are pretty vulnerable when a unit of enemy archers gets a hold of them. They're not actually firing at all, so I do wonder what Leech's thinking is here. This is the plan over here then we'll go back. Are the dwarves turning up the heat? Doesn't look like it actually. Dwarven miners are the ones moving forward now and the initial assault doesn't seem to have gone very well for Erebor. Though the front of nine nobles are buzzing around. That's the sort of thing which will concern them though. The crossbows did get a volley off but I don't think they're going to be able to stay where they were. Though the Ironfoot Spears being so close by it's going to limit the effectiveness of that cavalry. I would be careful with the cavalry. It's more likely to be more effective later on in the battle now that you've decided to leave them in the settlement as the assault is getting underway. They're kind of trapped. But as the armies start to look thinner on the ground, that's when the cavalry should be able to find gaps. The dwarven miners almost completely gone at the hands of the Rudar pikemen, but now the Ironfoot spears roll back in. Meanwhile, Darwinian over here, perhaps as a result of it just being Darwinian, but then again, there's Dale over here as well. They've got plenty of manpower, and I think they should be taking a leaf out of the attackers on the other side. Taking a leaf out of that book. And Carmel's Dragon Knights as well, Un undefended archers. And I will say, the attackers over on this side, it's been a bit of a clumsy effort so far, if I had to 
be brutal about it. Bulldozing their way through the Lake Town infantry there, but yeah, an assault. I think probably the thing that's worrying them is the Shadow Bows. They are in, after all, an ideal position and they probably do know they're here. But they're going to be there regardless of how long you wait, so it's one of those situations where I don't really know what you're gaining and ultimately with a little bit of uniformity among the attackers, everyone attacking, everyone really pressurising the lines, generally speaking we do see the superior manpower of attackers start to pay off in those terms. But will that be the case here? When things are a little bit more disjointed, that's where we often see things go a little bit wrong for attackers, even in a 3v5. Plenty of arrow fire coming in there, the Trollshaw Axe is taking an awful lot of damage. Even with the Carmels chosen on this front line, things are still looking a little bit suspect after the Ents did their damage. Another unit of Flag Room does arrive to help shore things up. I mean, going toe-to-toe, -to -toe, the Runic Infantry will... Not be too disappointed to see it's largely Elvel in there having to fight. That armour. Not going to be the boon that it usually is, perhaps. We would watch as they would get in behind the line, however. There is a gap on the front line now, and assassin units in behind, but they're immediately getting lit up by archers. Forward come Gamprim, Narim to squash them underfoot. Lumbermen in and amongst here as well. Low tier axemen. But they won't last too long in this kind of fight with the defensive attributes and shortcomings that they are known for. Elders of the Elven King, but yeah. They can keep up this assault still, the attackers, but not for an indefinite amount of time, which is why I'm still surprised that they're being more cautious over here. Oof. One of the Dragon's Breath cannons has fallen. But the fact of the matter is, with Dale backing up Dorwinian over here, they should have access to more numbers, and the Dalians maybe are going to be a little bit more well-suited for a fight that gets bogged down in a choke. But as it is, Ariag Mercenaries, out of ammunition perhaps, the ones to move forward. I mean, I don't necessarily agree with this from Seraphim, the Variag Mercenaries would be far more useful as part of a combined front line. Sending them forward on their own uh, is effectively just throwing them to the wolves. They will get a few kills, but nowhere near it. They wouldn't be as useful as they would be as part of the main line. Just offering more mass. Combined as they are, Blackshot Dragon Slayers. And yeah, there's a decent amount of Dalians over here as well. It's not as if helping the dwarves is their only concern. Speaking of the dwarves, they still haven't really made any progress at all either. Looks like another unit of Dwarven Miners was sent forward, and ultimately they too are making very little progress, though that unit of Dunman Pikemen at the very least does look to be largely gone, but Rudar Clansmen and Swordsmen, if Rudar are able to get away with just using basic infantry units, and <coughs> that is sufficing, that is a problem that needs to be addressed here for Arabal. There is an element of caution, which is understandable, given how... The manpower reserves they have to work with are slightly lower. Mm. But they do need to make something happen here, otherwise there will come a moment where they've just chosen the slow death rather than the quick one. Rudar still have plenty of reinforcements in the background as well. This fight over here though, the most active one on the field so far. Rune being tested maybe more comprehensively, but Rune's front line still doing quite well for itself. The Carmel's chosen. Not rated terribly highly as a bodyguard unit, and perhaps for good reason, given the fact that they are rather plain as things go, but in this kind of situation, this is actually where they do get to shine. A slower paced, slightly grindier front line battle, where they can be in support of all of the armor piercing units around them, offering their quality. And uh, certainly, Keldron River Patrol will not be the answer here that the attackers are looking for. More javelin fire. Volley after volley. Again, the attackers have been able to utilise their supporting units, so there may come a moment where runes 
front line does start to fall over because they don't have the numbers left to sustain it. But we'll see. And our Glade Guard on the way forward. I mean, fragile when it comes to trying to deal with projectiles, but it must be said, there's less of a presence from the runic ranged units over here now. Though something more substantial is definitely needed on the front line here for the attackers. I mean, another unit of River Patrol, another unit of El Valen Infantry is all well and good, but all they're, all they're really doing is kicking the can down the road. Greenwood Watchers. The Woodman Realm Patrol as well, and Andor Glade Guard. Now, we are actually pushing back against the Dwarves as well. I mean, some slightly scarier units. We did see the Halberds, and now they've been joined by the Axe Guard, but they're single-filing units of infantry in here, Erebor, and that is proving to be a terrible idea because they're not able to establish themselves on the front line. You can see artillery shots streaking through the sky in the background. Rudar, on the other hand, applying more overwhelming force to the front line, and that combined with some pretty heavy-hitting armor-piercing units now in the Enslavers and the Black Walls means that Erebor, they're going to need to change their tactics here because it's poor. Dale also sending forward some spearmen to try and help shore things up as well. I think what Erebor are trying to do is use their crossbows and axe throwers, trying to leverage them, but it's not really working for them. Once again, the Franadai Nobles, who have taken a lot of damage over time. Crossbow is probably the main culprit there, but still getting some decent charges off, though I would say that that cavalry is very unlikely to have paid for itself, so that's something that the attackers can take solace in. Ironfoot Spears, victory seems certain for them. A little bit surprised by that. Black Walls, as soon as they start swinging their big axes that kind of look like they're made of stone, Could be the answer. I'm for Axe Throwers, only 36 of them remain, but still enough to do a decent amount of damage if they can turn off the pressure. Meanwhile, over here, things are still pretty slow paced by the attackers. I mean, Narim, once again, another out of ammunition archer, effectively just stood in the way. Technically being thrown under the bus, though, based on the the pace of what the attackers are doing over here, I guess Rune won't care about that too much. And our Rim still have plenty in reserve over here, do the attackers, so they can at least launch an assault, which may worry the defenders, but they're going to need to do so sooner rather than later, I think. What's this? Here he out with the upgrade, so some of the chunkier Merkwood units now coming forwards, but you can see still the runic line is holding, though it is going to start to struggle with the kind of elven units they're facing off against now, also Nandor Blade Guard. The fact that a decent amount of this front line looks to be made up of stuff like Lugnar Rim, probably a bad sign for its health moving into the later stages of this fight. These strong crossbows still trying to offer their support. Huntsman of Amon Lank, I mean if there is a gap, maybe the cavalry can force its way through, but if there isn't, we may see just how fragile this kind of cavalry unit can be, though this is a little bit of a, a worrying moment for Rune. They do still have reinforcements, though they drag their heels a little bit when it comes to trying to actually deploy them, and the Huntsman of Amon Lank has, can now get in behind enemy lines. Leech being punished there. Here we are also in behind enemy lines, though they'll probably end up being dealt with by the fresh unit of Flagrim that have now been sent forward. Mm. You can see there, Huntsman of Amon Lank, when they did brush up against the Halberds, they died in droves, but that is a potential problem now. As much as they did get absolutely raked across the coals, that unit of Merkwood Cavalry, there is now cavalry in behind enemy lines and rampaging through the settlement. That's not the sort of thing the defenders want to be dealing with when they're still doing very well on the front lines as a general rule. If they can keep their focus, they will feel pretty confident that they can go on to be 
victorious in this battle. We do have Dunman and Pikeman to try and help shore up the line. Regular Ironfoot Warriors without the armor upgrades. I mean, Erebor, even with a bit of daily and support, starting to look a little bit. A little bit lower on manpower, though they can keep the assault going for a little bit longer than this. Once again, I just think Erebor's problem here is they haven't committed enough to the front line at any point. If they had compressed what they were doing, if they had sent their forces forward in more substantial chunks, I think we'd be seeing a very different kind of battle at this stage, but as it is, they've done that thing where it's they've not committed enough but they've also committed too much they've split the difference almost perfectly and it's to the benefit of the defenders so far meanwhile this front line is finally being tested now it's uh, all of the infantry the gamp rim the flag rim also another unit of out of ammunition bariac mercenaries in here as well nothing too important has been committed by the attackers so far, just some vine guards, some spearmen. There's no real damage dealers on the front line infantry wise here, which is going to lead to Rune being able to outpace their foes in terms of damage. What can they really do? Blackshot Dragon Slayers? That would be a, a decent option, just to try and do some damage quickly, try and make something happen way back there. There's still daily and spearmen. I don't understand why these units are so far away, to be honest. It means that they're going to have a fairly long transit time when it comes to trying to reinforce the front lines. Catapult fire thudding in. And they're over here still. I mean, none of the front lines have shown signs that they're, they're imminently going to fail. It's also an interesting sign that Rudar have sent over a unit of clansmen, feeling confident enough to send over infantry support to their allies, uh, considering the rather poor performance of the dwarves so far. Like when he bows, Sion River cut off really. They're fighting back to back, they are shaken, but made of stern stuff, they should remain in the fight for a fairly long period of time, even still. With the protectors moving forward, there's also the poison arrows now. All of the Eastron crossbows that we've seen in the background. Very difficult to keep track, of course, like I keep mentioning, of the effectiveness of individual units of skirmishers like that. But it's a reasonable assumption that Something like crossbows in this kind of situation would be doing quite well for themselves. And there is the Merkwood Cavalry. Still making a nuisance of themselves, charging in. Doing some damage to the Sapphire Bladesmen, but... You can see there that this is probably going to be the end of the Cavalry at this stage. No, they have been an annoyance, so that's better than nothing. Huntsman of Amon Lank might be the ultimate example of why I don't rate single HP cavalry anyway, because it's ridiculously expensive and very, very fragile, and also just not as good um, when it comes to dealing damage as the bodyguard tier units. Though they were not completely worthless on this occasion. Though they're certainly not going to be match winners for the attackers. Something else is going to need to make that happen for them, as still the runic lines hold and their supporting units continue to do damage. Kummel's shadow bows are here. A little bit surprised that the attackers are not trying to focus them down with maybe some of the fire from the Morakwendi bows. Instead they're still going after the crossbows, but we'll see if that proves to be a problem. Meanwhile, the dwarves are starting to look a little bit stronger. Another unit of Axe Guard of Arabor moving forward. Rudal looking a little bit thin on the ground, but they do send a unit of Dunman pikemen to help shore things up. In the background, Vanadine Rangers going to try and move them themselves into position. Lake Town pikemen on the way over, as well as some dismounted earls, so Dale sending more 
try and facilitate something to happen for the dwarves. I can only imagine that at some point the attackers are going to throw caution to the wind and just throw everything forwards. I mean, the dwarves don't really have anything left other than some black blocks, some halberds, and that's pretty much it. So their army's starting to run low on manpower, which is probably why Dale's sending over a couple of extra units so that this fight can continue for a little bit longer. But what does that mean for this front line over here? Winnie with our Valen infantry moving forward, some Balkoth tribesmen. For the most part, Rune have been able to get away with largely just committing basic units. Over here. Setting up a secondary defensive position here. Pretty nasty one as well. Nice kill box. That's exactly the sort of situation that the rangers should be pretty damn strong in. There's still Shadow Guard as well. Armor piercing. Going after the Dragon Knights. Interesting choice of target. There's the Dragon's Breath artillery crew, Sapphire Blazemen that are hidden. <laughs> if they were visible, there's a very real chance the Sapphire Blazemen would be the ones to be targeted, but as it is. Stalkers continue to fire. What have we over here? Are the dwarves still making progress? It doesn't look like it. I mean, Rudar are not the strongest units committed to the front line, Pikes and Rudar marksmen, but at the very least, you can tell that numbers wise, Rudar will be able to hold on to this front line for a little bit longer yet. Defeat seems certain, only a military genius could win this battle. Iron Foots. Those daily and reinforcements that I mentioned have now arrived. Lake Town Pikemen certainly won't go amiss. Going pike to pike with the cheap Rudar pikes and the dismounted elves, of course, are just a good quality unit of infantry. And now we had to mow their way through the likes of Rudar marksmen with impunity, so maybe a little bit worrying here for the Hillman, but. All they need to do is weather this storm for a little bit longer, and there's not really anywhere else that the attackers will be able to take this. Carmel's chosen, another unit of Carmel's chosen, going into the red limit on these bodyguard units. And their presence may be enough to keep the attackers still at arm's length. Another unit of Black Bolt. So Added Men has been sending over more reinforcements to help his ally out, and that may be a very key move. Because it does look as though the defenders are going to be outright victorious over here. And unless Erebor and Dale can beat Rudauer elsewhere, it's a sign that it was the right thing to do. Although Morakwendi Glademaster is still looking pretty damn healthy. In perfect health, in fact, and that's a very scary kind of unit to see coming towards you in the late game. More arrow fire. There's still the shadow bows as well. Seeing what damage rangers have done at the end of this battle for both of the runic armies will be interesting. There's still elders of the Elven King. There's still a unit of Hiri Lung, so between the Glade Masters and some of these stronger Mirkwood units, there is still hope based on quality for the attackers over here, but you have to say the kind of support that they still have over here, including the mighty Dragon's Wrath crossbows. Things are looking pretty dicey. And Darwinian spreading themselves out, testing the runic box that Seraphim constructed. And so far, the boys in gold will be very pleased with their day's work. More units on the way forward, Nandor Glade Guard. There's the Alvalin Vine Guard as well. Victory is a distinct possibility. More Quendi Stalkers firing in. Lake Town Pikemen. I mean, over here, actually, the runic line looks a little bit more suspect. Looks like some Vine Guard have managed to push their way through, so. Could this be a moment? It's been a far slower paced assault over here from Darwinian, but they have the opportunity now to make something happen. 
Oof, I don't know how Valen Vinegar though, getting clattered at full speed by the Dragon Knights. And of course, it's only if they can actually start attacking to Spearman have the ability to deploy that anti cavalry bonus. Sapphire Bladesman as well. Darwinian. Got the Shadow Bows firing in. Shadow Guards, Sa Tra Valkoth Tribesmen, and Sapphire Bladesmen. This is surely the best hope for the attackers at this point, because there is now forward momentum. Y2K throwing everything forwards. Combination of Halberds and those Dalian units that we've already seen. The Hranadine Berserkers and another unit of Witch Realm Enslavers are here, the Javelins. As long as they can keep this attack going a little bit longer, maybe it's enough for Y2K's Darwinian army to make something happen. But I do think that's the only hope that the attackers are really working to at this point. Etamore's Troll Hunters. Over here, the fight that got underway first, it's true for Shadow Bows taking on a unit of Woodland Protectors that have slipped in behind the lines, and that will at least see, stop the Rangers from uh, from firing. Forward we'll come the Heary Lung. Cornwall's Chosen doing a good job. Glade Masters, 25 of them remain. Again, I imagine crossbow bolts and arrows are played their part in that, but a Valen Hammerguard on the way forward. I think with the quality they have over here actually, the attackers will narrowly win. Going after the Hammerguard with Dragon's Wrath crossbows. They've done a good job so far, the defenders, but do they have enough in the tank to continue this? I think largely it's going to come down to this fight over here, and you have to say the way that Darwinian crashed through that front line and are now wrapping up the line. It doesn't look great from that perspective for the defenders as a whole. And there we also have Catapult Fire routing as well as a result of that hit. Some Dalian units. There goes a general. Things seem to be unravelling pretty quickly here for the defenders. The superior manpower the attackers have in a 5v3 may end up being the decisive factor once more. Still the javelins. Looping arrow fire as well. Warcrandy Glade Masters. The balance of forces is evenly matched. Even though they're surrounded by lesser units, they continue to cleave their way through. And it's this kind of unit in the late game which, if you don't have the ability to face it, it can be very demoralising. They still have some missiles and javelins and the like, but are they actually going to be able to deploy them effectively? The Gamp Rim, their formation is all compromised as well, getting hit by javelins from multiple sides. Could this be it? Marakwendi Stalkers firing away as well, Barding Herd on the way forward, so piling the pressure on at this point. I do think that the attackers will win that fight, but can the defenders win the other two? I think they will beat the dwarves over here. The warlord unfortunately has to be the fall guy on this occasion. Didn't help himself earlier on in the battle, I don't think, but at the very least managed to keep this attack going long enough that all of these Rudauer units have had to be bound up over here. They're not going to be able to go to Rune's rescue. There goes the Dwarven General. Time for Axtra is moving back. I mean, is that going to be enough to convince what remains of the Dwarves to rout? To flee for their lives? Sound Rim routing. Must be disheartening for Rudar if you see Seraphim's forces routing past you and fleeing the settlement. Yeah, the quality here is uh, is very high. Morakwendi Glade Masters, the Hiri Lun, taking a lot of damage, but we also have the Alvel and Hammerguard, who are actually losing by the looks of things to the Dragon's Wrath crossbows, but this fight is so close. Whoever wins over here is going to be it's gonna be a Pyrrhic victory at best, and 
the significant victory, I think, is going to be on the other side. With Y2K's army. Blades of Amanduia still alive also. Mm. East Strong Crossbowmen? There's no way that East Strong Crossbowmen surely are going to beat Morakwendi Glade Masters in melee. That will be the ultimate David versus Goliath story, I think. Meanwhile, we aren't going to see the final stand here. It's going to be entirely about the, uh, the outer layer. Yeah, this is a fairly substantial uh, victory on the outer layer by the attackers, and I think with that we'll start to see the domino effect rapidly take hold. Rune pretty much gone over here. The Dragon's Breath crew getting hunted by Swordmasters of Eskaroth. Surely they will send forward some other units as well to make quicker work of them. Dragon Knights still doing their thing. Dalian Paladins. And another high quality unit that still hasn't been dealt any significant blows. So that's Rune gone over here. That just leaves what remains of Leech's Rune army and the Rune Hour army under the command of Adin Men, who have been victorious over here. The dwarves are gone. One army apiece on the two sides. Vanquished. Hmm. What have we over yonder? Valen oh, Hammergard and Glademasters victorious. There goes Seraphim's general. Though admittedly, that's not exactly an important factor any longer. Ruda are the only ones. How the tables turn. Rudow now have to <laughs> try and reclaim their own settlement, but of course I think we all know that, that isn't really going to be happening. Quendi Stalkers still firing away. Mm. runic units as well, so yeah, this is pretty much consolidating into one final blob for a final stand here, Rudawa. Further in the background there, Dalian's on the way across. Still the Marquandi Stalkers as well. Player admits defeat, that could be, uh, it could be Leech, a player who we're viewing the battle from the perspective of. Kind of a weird one, this. This didn't actually work out at all like I was expecting. I really was expecting this battle to go the way of the attackers more quickly on the outer layer, but I was expecting the final stand to be employed at some point, though I, I guess the defenders dumped so much of their efforts into the outer layer that eventually it didn't make sense to retreat and just try and win the battle on the outer layer, but in the end it didn't work. Not enough numbers to make it work. Things were going pretty well for them in the first two thirds, three quarters I would say of the battle, but when the attackers really did put their mind to it, gaps were found. That's always the advantage you have playing as the attackers when you have such a substantial numbers advantage. Full cover barding herd as well. I mean the difference, five percent. Yeah, I'd say that makes makes sense. Right, when these stalkers charging in, trying to bring down what remains of Rudawa. Barding herd. Yeah, I think a deserved victory in the end, though. It was a little messy, maybe, by the attackers in some respects. Not an entirely uniform assault, but I, don't, I think the defenders had a plan A, and when just a quick survey of the battlefield 
probably was uh, probably would have revealed that this was always likely to happen in the long run. But yeah, that is going to be that. Elsewhere, everyone gathering in the same spot now. Run from the enemy. And there we have it. Not really much else to say at this stage. Mm. They did fight well. Oh, interesting. That's peculiar. What is going on here? Well, no matter. That's the first time I've seen something like that, but anyway, we will have a look at what did the damage for Rune, even if the game doesn't want us to see. Uh, we have 315 kills on Carmel's Shadow Bows, 199 kills on Carmel's Dragon Knights, that's pretty good. Several units breaking 100 kills here from Seraphim's army, Alkoth Tribesman, Flag Rim as well. Then Leech, Carmel's Chosen doing nicely, uh, but it's all the supporting units as you would expect over there, given the... Uh, the, pr the presence of all of those crossbows, the, the shadow bows getting 419 as well, but the infantry may be less impressive, but it's not too surprising given the amount of Moraquendi and uh, Sylvan Elves from Merkwood that they had to fight over there, but yes, it is what it is. Uh, this is rather peculiar, isn't it? But no matter. Um, big thank you to Leech for sending this one to me, and a big thank you as well to all of the players that were a part of this battle replay. It was a rather simplistic siege in the end, but again, um, it's a it's a map we've only seen once before. It's a, as far as a map goes, like I said, it is quite difficult for the defenders to uh, defend on. So I think they actually did reasonably well. Um, but yeah, as far as things to change go, it's 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 more of a judgment call. It's a lot of little things that add up into a result like this. And in the end, I think it was the attackers eventually deciding to be decisive and take matters into their own hands um, that truly made the difference here. So yeah. As for what's coming up soon, we've got a battle on the Cardinal Outpost and a battle on another map, which I don't know the name of, but we have seen a couple of times in the past. One of the, a couple of the maps that are basically in regular rotation at this point. Um, yeah, I'm feeling a little bit uh, off colour today, but I've got to try and record as much as I can before I get sent away for three weeks. So there is that. that that's probably why my um, if you can hear something a little bit off in my voice, or if you know you can. If the energy levels are not as high as they could be, that will be that will be why. Um, but yeah, um, it is what it is. Um, hopefully, by the time I get back from this three-week trip, we will be getting a better idea of when the next patch comes out, which is sorely needed. And um, there is also a few things regarding the channel that I will need to talk about at some point, though I imagine that that won't be for at least a couple more months at the time of uh, recording this. So. Again, we'll see. It's uh, it's all a little bit up in the air, as it often is. Um, the channel's still very much in survival mode, but it is what it is. Um, anyway, I'm going to go and take a bit of a lie down, I think. Um, big thanks to all the players and Leech once again. I hope you enjoyed this, and I hope you'll join me for whatever is next.